just want to welcome you to the Kansas Early Childhood Systems Building webinar. And this is going to be for 324. Um, we decided to give Debbie a break this week. So if you haven't met me yet, my name is Hannah McGahey, and I am the Workforce Coordinator for the, Chan the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund. And I will be hosting for you. Um, the format of today's presentation, we're going to start like we usually do with some general updates, and then we're going to have a really unique presentation from the Kansas State School for the Blind, um, specifically surrounding the Kansas Deaf Blind Project. And our guest presenter today is Maritas Altuna, and she is the project director of the Kansas Deaf Blind Project. So our first update for you um, is surrounding the Family Advisory Council, and if you're not completely aware of what the Family Advisory Council is. Um, it is a, a council comprised of families and share, shareholders um, who have loved ones that receive services. Um, and the Family Advisory Council is looking specifically to hear new voices, new opinions, experiences, and ideas, and looking for new contributors. Um, so they are launching a new work group. It's going to be the Women, and maternal work group, they're launching that, but they're still looking for some spots to be filled for the child work group, and that would be for ages six to 11. Um, so some important things to know about this advisory council and, and working on these work groups is um, really they're just looking for anybody who is interested in contributing to the child, to the, um, to the conversation surrounding these issues. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a family member that has a special health care need, disability, hearing loss, or other special need, um, and it is not required that um, participants receive services from the special health care needs program. So if you, um, if you follow the link that's listed on this slide, it's, it'll offer comprehensive information. You can look at all of the different work groups that are going on under the Family Advisory Council. Um, there's really informative, just one-sheeters that kind of describe um, the basic mission and initiatives and um, highlight kind of the, the key focus areas for each of the work groups. And then if you see the link there for the Survey Monkey, that will actually lead you through some some questions where you can find additional information if you're still not 100% that this opportunity is right for you. Um, so in doing some digging myself, it, I found that if you think that you might be interested in the childhood work group, you might find that you're, that you're very passionate in issues like access to screenings and preventative care, um, and just kind of comprehensive connections to services and early interventions that positively impact the health and well being of our Kansas children. Conversely, if you are maybe a little bit interested in the uh, women and maternal work group, you might be passionate about things like prenatal care, home visiting, preventative screening conditions, or preventative screening for conditions like depression, and just comprehensive public health education. So um, if any of those things piqued your interest, go ahead and go to the website there that's listed, um, and all of these will be put in the chat. Also, if none of this interests you, but it reminds you of somebody, and, and you know that they are passionate about these topics, um, the Family Advisory Council is looking for just interested participants. So just pass the information along and they would, they would love to connect them to where they fit. And here we just have some additional information. Um, and if you go onto the, the website for the Family Advisory Council, it's very easy to navigate. It's very easy to find people to connect with. Um, so any question that you have can be easily answered by just utilizing these resources. Another update that we have for you. So the Child Care Aware, so Child Care Aware of Kansas and then um, Kansas Department of Health and Environment and the Kansas Department for Children and Families have partnered together and um, are going to be offering child care impact grants. So the grant deadline is April 15th at 5 p.m. If you want more information, you can visit the Child Care Aware website. Um, but the intent of these child care impact, impact grants is to provide financial support for eligible child care programs to address facility needs, as well as needs that um, 
our product of or a continuing issue related to COVID-19 mitigation, health, health and safety. So like I said, if you've got questions about that, you can go to the Child Care Aware website and um, certainly be connected with somebody who has better information than I do. Additionally, we want to remind you that the 2021 annual conference for the Kansas Association for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health is coming up. It is April 29th and 30th, which is a Thursday and Friday. Um, the link here that's provided will tell you everything you need to know about registration fees, um, what kind of presentations and workshops are going to be offered. But um, the purpose of this annual conference is to give providers and people who work with families and children an opportunity to apply concepts from the KAIMH um, endorsement and just kind of provide some continuing education in those areas. Also, and you may have already gotten this update, but the date was changed or we had an error in the date. So just want to make sure that everybody is aware. Um, the rural sense making opportunity. So our, the our tomorrow's action lab is actually going to be tomorrow, uh, Thursday, March 25th at 3 p.m. You can register for that opportunity in the link provided. Um, and this is just going to be a virtual workshop and um, the group will work together to examine stories and experiences and kind of delve into that family voice from around the state to create some real time solutions to problems that people are facing right now. And there's actually some funding availability as well. Um, so if you need to know more about that, um, go ahead and you can register through this link here, um, but it's just gonna be a really great opportunity for our rural providers. Uh, we also have the Kansas State School for the Blind um, is providing a preschool enrichment program. And um, this is a no cost program for um, children ages three to five who are blind or visually impaired. It's no cost again, and it's held on Wednesdays and Fridays for three hours. Um, so we've got our link for registration here. And then we also have some good contact um, people if you've got additional questions, but definitely a great resource if, if you know somebody that has a child that's three to five and, and um, is blind or visually impaired. Okay, so now we get to the fun part. Like I said today, our presentation is going to be from the Kansas State School for the Blind. Specifically, it's going to be centered on the Kansas Deaf Blind Project. And give me a second here. Debbie, I don't know how you do this so seamlessly. Um, so if you are not aware, which I was not previously, the Kansas Deaf Blind Project provides technical assistance to families and educational teams that serve learners with combined hearing and vision loss in Kansas ages birth to 21 years old. So we've got Marita Saltuna, who, like I said, is the project director for the Kansas Deaf Blind Project, and she's going to tell us everything we want to know about this specific initiative. So Maritas, I will turn it over to you. Hannah, can I share? I'm going to go and share my screen, okay? Yep, you are good to go. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to spend the Wednesday lunchtime with all of you. So let me share a little background information before I dive in our top, into our topic. Most of you may be aware of the National Deafline Count. It is the first and the longest running count of children who are deafblind in the world. It started in 1986. And the purpose of the count is to identify trends and needs within the population. The data is collected by each state and compiled by the National Center on Deafblindness for the US Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. One of the interesting findings of the count is that many children with deafblindness are not referred to the state deafblind projects until after age three or older. 
So I look at the data that we have in Kansas for the last 10 years. Early identification and referral of young children birth to two to the Kansas Deafline Project continues to be a challenge. So I do really appreciate the opportunity to be with you this afternoon to talk about how you can help identify and refer improve outcomes of young children with deaf blindness in Kansas. My name is Marita Saltuna. I am the director of the Kansas Deaf Blind Project. Now, if I can move my slide, it's perfect. <laughs> Goodness. Okay, great. Today's objective is to increase your awareness of the services that we provide we will also discuss an overview of deafblindness, its impact, risk factors, prevalence, and the referral process. And this is simply an overview, so please contact me if you need additional information. So what is the Kansas Deafblind Project? In addition to what Hannah stated, every state in the nation has a deafblind project including Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. We are a network of projects, state projects, connected by the National Center on Deafblindness. The Kansas Deafblind Project is an extension of the Kansas State School for the Blind Field Services, and we serve the entire state. Our funding comes from a federal grant from the Office of Special Education Programs, U.S. Department of Education. Okay, our, our job is to provide free technical assistance to families and service providers of individuals with deaf blindness birth to 21 years of age. We offer professional development training, individual student consultation, limited scholarship to attend conferences. We also have a mini grant. We provide person-centered planning, transition support, and family engagement activities. Our goal primarily is to build local capacity in serving these children in your agency. The next slide, we will be looking at a video uh, to illust illustrate deafblind perspectives from professional and parents. While we know in terms of helping educate the general public, it really helps to put a face to something to help people identify. Um, that's impossible within our deafblind community because uh, there isn't a typical uh, portrait of someone who is deafblind. Deafblind is, is, is incredibly diverse. It's one of the most diverse um, disabilities out there. Because deafblindness is so rare, and uh, families are usually the only ones within their community who know the most about deafblindness, specifically as it relates to their child, they are constantly put in the position of having to help educate others about deafblindness and about their children. And this goes across the board. It means educating medical professionals about deafblindness and the medical issues that need to be addressed. It's, it's helping educate uh, the educators about deafblindness and the education strategies that might work best for their child. I was a teacher of students with visual impairments for 30 years before I had that first child with deaf blindness. And what I didn't know about a child with deaf blindness would have filled a room. The deaf blind learning style is so unique. I don't know who said it first, but they were right. They said it's not deaf plus blind, it's deaf times blind. All humans crave connection communication, the exchange of ideas and feelings and thoughts is a way of creating connection. It's very complex um, and every deafblind person, child is totally different, but deafblindness is, is huge. It's huge. The federal definition of deafblindness is concomitant hearing and visual impairments, the combination of which 
causes such severe communication and other developmental and educational needs that they cannot be accommodated in special education programs solely for children with deafness or children with blindness. And the term deafblind may be frightening to some parents or family members. Although the word implies a complete absence of hearing and sight, deafblindness is actually defined as a combination of hearing and vision loss to some degree. These includes progressive loss, functional loss, processing issues of both hearing and vision, such as cortical visual impairment, central auditory processing disorder, auditory neuropathy, and other diagnoses. Um, deaf blindness is sometimes referred as a dual sensory, sensory loss or called a combined hearing and vision loss. Individuals who are deafblind has unique experiences of the world. For people who can see and hear, the world extends as far as their ears and eyes can reach. For young children who combine hearing and vision loss, their world is much narrower. Uh, there is an article that I read about our senses and, when the re and what the research tells us about their abilities, how much information each of our senses processes compared to other senses. 83% comes from sight, 11% from hearing, 3.5% from smell, 1.5% from touch, and 1% from taste. And the article also shared an example to help us understand it better. And so we're, we're just gonna do like a two second experiment and you can answer, you can unmute and answer, or you can, um, put it on the chat. So let's imagine that you are in an open field. How far can you see? Anybody? <laughs> How far do you think can you see in an open field? To the, the, uh, huh? to the horizon. Yes, yes, and then the article said about 50 miles. You know, it depends on, on the person. I, when I was driving to work this morning, um, I was driving on 635, and I was I can see from 635 the buildings in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, so how far can you hear? How far can our hear reach? Hearing reach. maybe a mile or two, but how about smell? How far can you smell? Okay, that depends on the smell, right? <laughs> it says about 20, maybe 20 yards. I, don't, I have not tried that. Assuming that the wind is not blowing, how about touch? Touch is just an arm's length. And how about your taste? It's just a couple of inches. Deaf blindness is a disability of access. It significantly limits children's ability to gather information from people and their environment. Even when there is a mild loss in either of the senses, the information the child receives is incomplete, confusing, and sometimes distorted. The two distant senses, hearing and vision, connect people to the world beyond their own body space. A combination of hearing and vision loss affects all areas of development, communication, exploration, social interaction, concept development, independence, and incidental learning. And incidental learning is what children learn by watching, listening, and putting together, making sense of what is going on around them.
Deaf blindness is the lowest of low incidence disability. There are over 7 million children, 3 to 21 years old, who are receiving special services in the U.S. in 2018-2019 school year. In contrast to the number of deaf blindness, birth to 21, uh, there are over 10,000 children in the country. And smaller in Kansas, there are 158 children birth to 21 years old who are on the Kansas Deaf Blind Project Registry. Oftentimes, these children are the only one in their school or community with this diagnosis. The graphic on the right side of your screen is information about children birth to three years old. According to the data from ECTA Center, there are over 400,000 children birth to three with IFSB or Individual Family Service Plan in the U.S. in 2019. In Kansas, we have over 10,000 children birth to three with IFSB in 2020. Out of the 10,000 children that's receiving special services, the Kansas Deaf Blind Project received 14 referrals. Two of these children are one year old, four children are age two, and eight children are age three. And as I mentioned earlier, referral to the Kansas Deaf Blind Project increases when children are age three and older or when they are in in the elementary age. So who, who are these little ones with deaf blindness, right? Where, where do we find them? There is no one profile for a child that's deaf blind. It is a diverse population. Some kids with deaf blindness have other disabilities. In addition to hearing and vision loss, there are also Deaf blind individuals who are deaf blind who does not have any other um, additional disabilities. Where do we find them? As early childhood providers, we must be familiar with the risk factors, and we will talk about the risk factors later. Always review medical records and health history. You can obtain information during interviews with a family, such as during intake or developing. IFSB. You may also do observation anytime you are with a child on a home visit or when doing a screening. Now, if you're working at an um, early childhood classroom, you know, you can still do an observation. And whose role is it to refer? Any member of the team or parents can make a referral to the Kansas Stuff Line Project. And on our website, uh, there's an application form there that you can go and fill out. When a child is, th this is um, another benefit of being on the Kansas Deaf Line Project. When a child is referred to, the, to us, it makes the child eligible to apply for the Kansas Deaf Line Fund administered by the Kansas Department of Education. Children might be at risk for having combined hearing and vision loss due to some factors. On your screen are some prenatal conditions, birth complications and postnatal conditions, generic syndromes and disorders, and some additional conditions that are considered risk factors for deaf blindness. It's actually a lot, a lot of them. However, not all individuals with these conditions will qualify as deafblind. But when you hear these factors, please make sure to follow up on vision and hearing evaluation or pay close attention to the vision and hearing skills and development. On the 2019 child count, the primary identified ideologist for deafblindness, um, I, I read wrote down five of them. The first one is Chard syndrome, Usher syndrome, Down syndrome, Stickler syndrome, Dandy Walker syndrome. And sometimes we don't equate deaf blindness with, with those other syndromes. 
renal congenital complications, the first three primary identified CMV. Is it cytomegalovirus? So for me to pronounce, that's a long word. Um, hydrocephaly, microcephaly, those are the top three. When, when observing children, there are also signs and symptoms that may indicate visual impairments in the young children. The atypical appearance of the eyes, and I have some examples on the screen as well. Unusual eye movements, jerky movements, you know, nystagmus, absence of eye moving together. Some eyes are, you know, one eye is turned inward, the other one is outward. Um, unusual gaze or head positions, when their heads are tilted to in a certain position when looking at an object, they are holding their objects close to their eyes, or they seem to be looking, but you know, they seem to be looking, but they avert their gaze. There's also the absence of visually guided reach, which is um, lack of eye contact by age three months, lack of visual fixation following or following by three months, and accurate reaching of objects by six months. If you see red flags, uh, pro probe a little bit, just ask questions. There are also some signs and symptoms that may indicate hearing loss in young children. The same thing, typical appearance of face or ears, some malformations, a typical listening behavior, a few or inconsistent responses to sounds, does not seem to listen, does not respond to caregivers calling his or her name. I typically get those. Um, shows a preference for certain types of sound. A typical vocal development. These are um, children has limited voc vocalizations, has abnormalities in voice, intonation, articulation, shows delays in language development and other behaviors such as or breathing through their mouth or tilting their head to one side. Okay, <laughs> this screen has some more terms I can't pronounce. Those are the red flags. And again, it, it doesn't mean that they may qualify for deaf blindness. It's just saying to us as providers of young children to, to pay a little bit more attention to the development of those distant senses. Anoxia, you, you guys can read down the list. And there are also red flag comments that we hear sometimes. Um, sometimes he seems to see things, other times he doesn't. Or she has a syndrome called charge, but the eye doctor said her vision is fine. Or this little guy spent two months in the NICU and his records say that he lost oxygen at birth. Uh, some couple more red flag comments. This child has cortical visual impairment as a result of head trauma when he was a baby, but there's nothing in his records about a hearing problem. This little girl has a syndrome I've never heard of. Again, these don't mean for sure that deaf blindness will be present, but close attention needs to be given to vision and hearing skills development. I can't see the other side of my slide. <laughs> okay, implications of prematurity. Everybody knows there is an implication. Survival rate of younger lower birth weight, survival rate of younger lower birth weight in medically fragile infants has increased steadily. Infants who are preterm are at higher risk for sensory loss. You know, vision and hearing are the most complex sensory systems and neuro neurological complications can affect visual and auditory processing. Okay. 
Looking at prenatal sensory development, typical sensory development follows a sequential maturation process, touch, vestibular, gustatory, olfactory, auditory, and visual. Each of these systems interact with the other system. Each system impacts every other system. Compromise to one system affects all systems. So vulnerable sensory systems require supportive intervention. It is recommended that children with one diagnosed sensory loss be evaluated in the other area. And sometimes we don't put them together. A child has hearing, a child has vision loss, and we don't put them together as deaf blind because what we think of deaf blind is you can't see and can't hear, but it's a combination of hearing and vision loss to some degree. Referrals to medical and educational services should be made in a timely manner. Do not wait and see. They're, the early years are critical, especially in the areas of social, emotional, and communication development. Referring children who are deafblind to the Kansas Deafblind Project allows the family and providers to receive technical assistance and support from us. Early identification and referral will also help families understand their child's sensory loss and learn how they can support their child's growth, growth and development. And I know that it's very difficult to get uh, evaluation for vision when a young child is, is you know, very young. But we, we typically, if, if I don't have the evaluation report from the doctor and the team has a concern, we typically give a provisional certification or take the child's age that it's very difficult to assess a young child, especially if there are other um, health issues that are concerned. So we're, we're a little bit more lenient because they're young. And then we review their records after three years. And sometimes when they're three, some kids when they're three, they may no longer qualify. It's just that there are concerns when they're young. And, and of course, we want to get them when they're younger. The next slide are parents who have gotten services for from the Kansas Deafline Project. And so let's hear what they have to say. Hello, I attended the Deafblind uh, conference today um, here at the Discovery Center. Um, I was able to gain a lot of information about supported decision, guardianship, had a real diverse group of people that attended. I was able to ask questions and get answers. Hi, my name is Jessica and I have a daughter with deaf blindness. Uh, recently, we were able to be the recipients of a generous uh, gift for going to Great Wolf Lodge. And that was so fun and we really enjoyed being a part of that, mostly because we were able to take our two older children as well. And so the whole family got to benefit from the gift uh, that we received. Um, that was really fun, we had a good time and my daughter loves the swimming pool, so she was able to swim freely and enjoy herself as well. And we got a chance to meet other parents who have children with deaf blindness, and that was really special as well because uh, it, it means a lot to be able to walk through um, on the same journey as someone else and to know that there's support out there. Hi, uh, my name is Karim Pirani. I am father of Ashia Pirani. She was diagnosed with Chad syndrome uh, when she was born and uh, she has received multiple surgeries and Chad syndrome's characteristics are uh, vision loss and loss of hearing and the Kansas Deaf Blind Project has helped us through this journey to attend a Chad syndrome conference that was held in Dallas. Uh, this conference was useful to us as we were able to meet uh, and interact with parents uh, with Chad syndrome diagnosis and also uh, get uh, various opinions on 
the therapies that are that other parents are following to and compare it to what we are doing uh, in Kansas City. So uh, we are very thankful to Kansas Deaf Blind Project for providing us with the assistance. Thank you. I am moving to the next slide. <laughs> That's not going to move. I thought it stuck. So remember that learners who are deafblind are an incredibly diverse group. Some learners are deafblind as are caused by trauma or an accident. So it doesn't happen when they're young. Deafblindness is a disability of access, of gathering information. It's, it's challenging. Incidental learning is challenging for kids with sensory loss. A learner with deaf blindness is not a deaf child who cannot see, or a blind or a blind child who cannot hear. Deaf blindness is a unique and complex disability. You know, um, service providers like us come and go as young children grow and transition from their homes to preschool, from school age to adulthood. But the Kansas Deafline Project will be a resource to the family until the student is 21 years old. So they may not need us when they're young, but just the fact that we know of them, we can send them information. And so when they are ready, or they need something, for example, when the child is in kindergarten or 10th grade, then they have a resource, they are familiar with the resource that we provide. If you know someone who is deafblind or suspect a child has combined hearing and vision loss, even if it's mild, please contact the Kansas Deafblind Project. My contact information is on the screen. You can also visit us on our website for additional information. This is a uh, little snippet. And we do have a Facebook, it's a private Facebook because we have families that are a member of that Facebook. We have providers as well. Uh, so you have to request membership and answer the question why you want to be a member. And it's interesting because if we don't screen that our private Facebook, sometimes we get there's someone from Nigeria or someplace in the world. And, you know, this is a private Facebook and we talk about our kids and our families and our events. And there are some information there that we just don't want to, to get out to everybody. So that's it. I, I, what a, what a nice ending, right? That's it. <laughs> when you guys do a presentation next time, just end it with that's it. <laughs> I, I do really appreciate your, your time, all 70 of you that are participating today. So if you have any questions, um, I'll be glad to answer them. Or if you don't have any questions, I'll, I'll be glad to. <laughs> I'll be glad to take that as well. Well, I have a question. I've heard in so many cases that uh, it's really, really important to um, uh, to find um, and diagnose and screen kids really early uh, with many. Um, developmental delays. Um, can you talk a bit about the um, the challenges or I mean, well, you've talked about the challenges of identifying early, but um, some of the uh, uh, your sense that um, how much more important it is uh, or uh, to to identify early uh, in this case, um, just I mean, just talk a little bit more about early identification because I noticed that one of your slides said that so many kids are not getting referred until much later. Um, does that mean that the 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 occurrence, I mean, the 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 delay doesn't appear earlier, or or that 
what, what's the reason for not identifying early? And if we had identified earlier, what would be some, you know, some um, more positive outcomes? <clears throat> yeah, that is a really good question, Rich. Um, and it, it's not just in Kansas that we're having that issue. It's it's uh, the other deafblind projects, state deafblind projects as well. My, I don't know. I, I can't tell you why. I have not talked to, I don't know if parents are familiar if their kids are young or they have other issues that may be more pressing in their hearing and vision, so they don't refer. But, and, and when do they refer? I know, it, like I mentioned this earlier, it's really hard to get an evaluation, especially for vision. It's, it's the last one to develop, it's, it's tough. So I go with the, if a team has a concern, we're very concerned about this kid. Uh, we're not, we're not sure some things are going on. And then they tell me that and I, I take their professional judgment. And we register a child for three years, certified child for three years. And then after three years, we do a reevaluation. They need to submit additional information about their hearing and vision. And by that time, the child is older. And sometimes their vision or hearing loss is more evident than when they are young. And why do we want them to certify early, right? Why can't we just wait until they're six years old? We know that early intervention is critical for these kids. And there's not a lot of, we don't have, in Kansas, we don't have certification for, it's not like teacher for the visually impaired, you have that, or teacher for the deaf, hard of hearing, we have that, we do have the certification. We don't have a teacher for the deaf blind. And so what we do is we wanna partner with a team. We want to develop local capacity in, in your agency or in your area, wherever you are, we can partner with you. And we can look at how many kids you have identified in that location. What do you need to serve these kids? And then we give you, we do have really good consultants that will work with you to give you information or strategies to work with kids with combined hearing and vision loss. And some kids are more difficult than others. And then we can also work with the families. There are families that are, I was talking to a mom with a child who's four months old and receiving services. We do have networking for families that are just wanting to talk to different families, support group. Our family engagement coordinator has a child with Sarge syndrome, uh, has combined hearing and vision loss. We do have a Discover CVI. 40% of the kids in the registry has cortical visual impairment. And so families are looking for groups like that. There are some outside Kansas that's different when you're just here in your state. And so we do have a Discover CVI that meets monthly. It's led by two parents. I'm, I'm there only because we're supporting it, but the, the parents kind of decide the topics that they want. And this week they met, there's no agenda this week. They were just talking about their different experiences about the pandemic challenges that they received for some uh, evaluation from doctors. So those are the things that would be helpful if they are registered early. So they have that support group. Did I answer your question, Rich? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for asking. We've got some time. So does anybody else have any questions? This has been a really excellent presentation and just a really great conversation. So feel free to speak up. You know, I, it's not me, I'm not talking about me, Hannah, but I'm going to take this opportunity. <laughs> Since I have a six to seven captive audience, I'll just take advantage of, of this opportunity. Um, you know, when I took this job a few years ago, one of my tasks is to go out there 
um, Mind Tiny K Networks to present about the Cancer Death Line Project, just to spread awareness. And so the All In for Kansas, this group is just like a one-stop shop. You just go there and it record it and disseminates too. So it saves me gas. It's not that I can go right now, but I, I am grateful for, for you guys tuning in. Well, we are very, very grateful for you. Um, I can say as you know, somebody that works in this field, somebody that is a parent, somebody that is just a person, I don't know that I've really ever considered this issue. Um, and you have provided us with so much information that we can you know, touch and feel and, and try and consider in our daily lives, whether that's professionally, um, in the children that we interact with, or personally in the people that we know, and maybe families that we know are struggling with things. And so I'm very grateful that you are here today. Um, just so informative and I'm very grateful that, like you said, you got the opportunity to speak to a variety of people and we don't know the bounds of where this information will go. Um, but just for me sitting there, when you were asking us to imagine ourselves in a field, uh, I'm a Kansas girl, I've lived here my whole life. So, you know, if I close my eyes and I think about being in a field and not being able to see that Kansas sunset or not being able to smell, you know, at, at, the, at the, uh, the level that I'm used to, kind of that dirt and that the crop and not be able to hear the rustling. Um, and then to imagine a child going through that alone or a child's family going through that alone and not knowing that there are people out there with specific knowledge and supports. Um, so I'm just very grateful that you were able to present with us today. Um, and I'm very hopeful that our, our participants, our colleagues here uh, are able to use this information to help families and children that may be experiencing this by themselves. And, so and we I, are very appreciative to you. I also want to say that we partner with, with agencies. Um, right now we are doing Music and Me, which is a, it's a music therapy online. So we're doing that with kids with visual impairment and um, deaf blindness. I also partner with the Wyandotte County Infant Toddler Services, and we have created a video. It's just a very short video. It's called the Sensory Nursery Rhyme. It's intended for a parent. Um, just very basic. You can do anywhere, even if you're waiting at a doctor's office. So um, there are things that we can do with that. If, if you want to create something, partner something. Oh, the other thing that we're doing is we are partnering with STEMI. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, God, what, what state are they? They are um, providing ideas and, and learning, training, technical assistance to providers with, for children with disabilities about STEM and access. I mean, access is very important for those as well. Okay, that's it the second time. Thank you. I think that is the best ending. I won't, st I won't steal it because it's yours and it's really great, but that's a really good ending. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead. We just have a couple of reminders for you guys. Um, let me move stuff so I can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, so our early childhood recommendations panel meeting, the next one is gonna be April 16th. And as always, you can view that on YouTube. Um, that is my favorite way to do it. Um, we have another bi-weekly webinar. We, we, have that scheduled for April 7th. So as always, if there's something that you want to know more about, if there's a gap in the resources that you think we haven't addressed, if there's just anything that you would like to um, have us hold this space for, get in touch with any of us and we'll be more than willing to fill the calendar. Um, we have our full cabinet and stakeholder group meeting on April 9th, just as a reminder. And then you're always free to share your thoughts anytime at the link provided. Um, and we, we want to hear your feedback. Um, but once again, I just, just thank you, Maritas, for your fabulous presentation. That was, that was wonderful. 
and that's all we have for you today.